cities are changing very fast. And every day we're seeing new technologies and we have to embrace the technologies, or we have to fight it. But in order to, to understand how the cities are changing and what's happening in our transport system, we need to go a little bit back. We need to understand where do we, how do we became in the position that, where we are now. We had congestion in the streets. We had to bring this guy to stand in the middle of the road to solve the traffic problems, and he had to breathe all the pollution coming out of these cars. And we felt that this is not the best solution. The best solution was to build more freeways and get out of the congestion, build our way out of the congestion by building the freeways, and the cars can be going so fast. But our problem is that after we build these freeways by a couple of years, we found ourselves stuck in congestion again. So we went back to, the, uh, to this main point. But the major uh, uh, issue that people started thinking, okay, what is the solution? So we came up with a new solution. But 2015 came, this didn't come to us. The flying car didn't arrive. We have been waiting, all of us, for it. It didn't come to us. But we're still dreaming. We're still dreaming in China for the bus that's going to eat the cars. And we're still dreaming about the Hyperloop that's going to go very fast under the ground. Or the boring company that Elon Musk is proposing to dig under the ground and have these pods and people will be transported very quickly uh, from, from one point to another. But the reality of the future of the transport, we know that we have a lot of electric cars coming down uh, right now. And we know that... Google is apply, uh, Wyoming, which is part of Google, are traveling uh, all over the United States, especially in Phoenix. They had 8 million miles now achieved. They are achieving almost 1 million every month of automated vehicle, a vehicle driving itself, and someone sitting uh, just watching how things are going. BMW, Mercedes, all these companies are applying these automated vehicles that's going to change the world and going to change the, 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 the transport system. And we have to get ready for that. But what we know from the past is that when we build new roads, when we add new roads, when we have cars, we'll have congestion. When we have electric vehicles, we'll have congestion. And when we have automated vehicles, we'll also have congestion. For the, at the beginning, we'll need less space, but we'll have more congestion. And then when we get these cars to be Ubers or Lyfts, we'll have more congestion as well. And something else, you'll get some Pokemon Go people like my seven-year-old, he'll be sitting in a car going on and catching all the Pokemons and picking all the Pokestops along the freeway because Pokemon Go, are, are like, they're going to put the, the Pokestops along the, the freeways. They're not going to, nothing is going to stop them, you know, they place them in the graveyard. Do you think they're going to stop on the freeways now and they know that you're safe to go in the, uh, on the freeway? So they're going to put that and then we'll get more congestion from people uh, <coughs> like my son. Or <laughs> seven years old. So, but the thing is that we need to know how much space a car needs. The car needs a lot of space. Humans can take less space. If you put them on bicycles, they are less space. If you cram them in a bus, they are less. If you put them in a light rail, they take much smaller space. So we have to always remember that the car is, is a solution for one issue, but we have to think of other solutions. The other solutions can give us lots of opportunities that we can achieve what we want through traveling and through reaching our destinations. If we go back to the basics in the transport and land use system, we know that when you open a new freeway, when you change the transport system, you increase how much, how, how, what you can reach. When you open a freeway, what expect, well, at, the, at the first exit, what do you expect to open? What will be the first thing that's going to open at the, at the exits? Gas stations, what else? Um, McDonald's, convenience stores, and right next to the McDonald's, the Burger King is going to come and open next day. <laughs> and accordingly to that, we'll have a community, and then we'll have the activity patterns, we'll start changing the transport again, and then we'll keep going in that cycle. This cycle can take from a year to 30 years to complete itself. And our job as transport planners and engineers and professionals is that we try to impact this cycle. We try to make sure that the cycle is moving <coughs> slowly or moving fast, depending on what we think is favorable for the, for the people and what actually the people want. We try to impact the activity patterns, which is, I'll, I'll be concentrating with you a little bit on the activity patterns. But we know that we have a new generation that is taking over the streets now. The generation that's really hinged to their 
cell phones and really attached to their cell phones. My daughter, she's 19, in order to get her down for dinner, I text her. So I sent her a text, calm down, we, it's dinner time. Can you come and clean the dishwasher? By a text. So here, in, like randomly, I was walking in Montreal, took this picture, I found that almost all four of them are attached to their cell phones somehow either through their ears or either through something. So we need to understand that there's a new generation with different dynamics that we need to impact, and we need to make sure that they are not falling in the same problems or getting us into the congestion as we, uh, as we had in the past, trying to understand the dynamics of the new generation. Because what we learned is that when you teach people when they are young about something, it will stay with them when they get older. So when we looked at how people were using public transportation in Montreal when they, are, well, they were young and compared that how, well, as they age, we found that if they, use, they start at a higher level by putting restrictions on, on driver's license in Montreal and in Quebec, we ended up with people still using public transportation as they age and as they go uh, older in their ages. So when you teach someone on something when they are young, it stays with them and they embrace it and they teach it to, uh, to their parents or they teach it to their colleagues. They have an impact on the society. When you teach children about safety on cycling, their parents themselves, they start saying, oh, it's a good, I feel that my son knows how to cycle better now. When you go and, and, and apply program, uh, 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 in there, the children themselves will feel much more confident about cycling, about using these alternative modes of, tra of, tra of transport. Because what we know is that individuals, humans are like test tubes. Each one of us has his own needs. Each one has his own preferences in terms of travel and in terms of uh, what we want to reach or what kind of destinations. As a student, I want to reach uh, my school and I want to reach a lot of bars or I'd like to reach something else. What do I want to reach? I want to reach restaurants, I want to reach convenience stores. So each person will have their own uh, needs. So we have to develop policies that can differentiate people, that impacts people differently. Because not all people are the same. It's not a herd of people go, go, cheaps going up the stairs. No, these people are different. In the transit system, you have the captive users, those who don't own a car, who cannot afford to have a car. We have the captive by choice, these who, who choose not to own a car because they want to use uh, public transportation, they want to use active modes. And we have the choice users who owns a vehicle but choose to use, a, to use the public transport. We need to develop the policies for each group and embrace them and make sure that they are happy using the systems. In a scarce resource kind of time, we want to make sure that we are applying the policies in the right locations. So we understand the different groups and where they live, and based on where they live and where the, what are their needs, we try to put the policies for each group to make them happy with their commute. Because when we look at, at, at places like the Netherlands, at 7 a.m. when I went outside to take a picture, that was what I saw in the Netherlands. People were so happy in there when they are cycling and going to school. Why? What's happening? Because they thought about all modes of transport. They didn't think about the car only. They sort of thought about the bicycling. They thought about what makes people happy. Because making people happy in their commute and making people happy in their lives is the goal. It's not just to make an automated vehicle and, and put people in, in them and then we get stuck in congestion again. It's about how can we make things happier? How can we impact people's internal factors, your personal characteristics, your, your education, how you grew up a, as a child, and how to make you sure that you embrace the, the, the uh, active modes, so then you can use them and you will be satisfied with your trips. And also try to improve the trip characteristics for every group that we are dealing with and that we are trying to, to design the system for. Because we know that some modes will be at a higher energy when you reach our destination. If you are cycling, you're more energetic. If you're in a car, you're less energetic at work. We know that you'll be more stressed if you are driving in some cases. And in the cold weather in Canada, we have a lot of snow, so it gets us really stressful in, in, in the cold weather. But if you are cycling, you're less stressed. If you are in, in the summer, we try to make sure that everybody is less stressed and we have making sure everybody reaches their destinations with the energy that they can be producing. But we know that it's a complex system. It's a very big system. And how can we impact that system? How can we make some changes in the system? And in, in, in a time when we don't have a lot of funding to change the systems, 
we felt that the best way to change the system is small improvements. Small improvements can make a big difference in people's lives and can attract people to use different cars, different modes of transports. Trying to make sure that people who are using transit can have seamless transfers. Trying to people to teach them some ethics, force the ethics on them, tell them you have to go into the, the metro from the, from the middle and if you're getting uh, like the, the step to the sides for people to get out of the metro. You want to make sure that to give people uh, like next arrivals, so you reduce the anxiety. People are not uh, uh, excited and waiting and it's like, will my train come or not? And they're attached to their phone. Give them the information on their cell phones and attach it to them so then they know when is the next bus coming. They know if it's late. They know how far it's going to take me to get to my destinations. And that will make people happy. That will make people use the system and embrace it and keep using it. Try to apply new strategies. Think outside of the box. Have an express bus that goes from point A to point B that doesn't have to stop at every stop. Make sure that the bus is going fast. Make sure that people can board quickly on the bus so you don't have to wait for a long line. And when you wait for that long line, people are unhappy, and they, but you have also to educate that so, some of the people, that the grandpa and grandma, when they, that this person who's boarding from the back, he actually paid. He's not cheating the system. No, they actually paid. And they shouldn't be frustrated from them because they are saving everybody time when they are boarding uh, the system. If you don't have uh, universal ac uh, access like here in, in, the, in the United States, the American with Disability Act, make sure that people on wheelchairs can access the system. You don't need the Canadian Prime Minister to be standing at every metro station to get people down the, the, uh, the escalators. In New York, for example, you have um, breakdowns in the elevators at least 50 times per year an elevator, so a person in a wheelchair cannot get down to use the system. It's not reliable. One day they will come to use the system, the next day it's not working. So we want to make sure that we have universal access and everybody can access the system. No matter who you are, no matter what, what, uh, what kind of disability you have, you can use the system. We want to change the laws. We want the ch laws to be sensitive because when we ask people in Montreal how many laws are you obeying, we find that 0.06% are obeying the laws of cycling in Montreal. Okay, so the laws are not designed for these people to use the system. So we have to change the laws. We have to make sure that the laws are allowing people to use the system and integrate and use the cycling so we are not just giving tickets for no reasons for people because actually no one, like almost 70% broke at least three of the laws that we gave them as an example to, uh, if they are adhering to or not. Try to have bicycle transit integration and try to make sure that the transit system is working together with the, with the cycling system and they are talking to each other. One of the things we'll find at some point, we'll find more interruptions in the system. So in Seattle, they woke up in the morning and they found these things f falling from the air over them. Okay, and they're going to happen. And we have to embrace them, we have to work with them, and we have to make the laws that we can not have all of us can use the system, reach our, our transit from the beginning at the first mile and the last mile. We solve the, this problem and we embrace the technology, but we try to make sure that we are moving forward with, with, the, with the new systems. So the future is more about many modes, not just automated vehicles. It's the future is about walking, cycling, car, uh, automated vehicles and buses. We need to keep these systems all working together so we can m really move to the, uh, to the future. Because if we don't do that, we'll find ourselves still sitting in pods and talking to each other through, through screens like these two guys when they are talking to each other. And that's not like my point of view, it's the point of view of many people who worked with me in the past. Thank you.